Okay, anyway, we're going to talk about uh, a bunch of stuff that hopefully will jog your memory and guide a bit of your reviewing. It's not, uh, in, you know, in an hour to do an all-encompassing review of everything you need to know about paints, but there'll be a fair amount. It is useful, and there are some things, you know, the way I used to approach this was to think about what I would ask if I were writing the test. I think that's a useful, it was a useful strategy for me in terms of thinking about different things. And, you know, there are obvious things about blood vessels. One of the questions is what, as far as blood supply to muscles, we're talking about, you know, pediatric ophthalmology, what's different as far as blood supply to the rectus muscles? Just thinking of the rectus muscles. How many anterior ciliary vessels do you have in each muscle? Two, except lateral rectus typically has one. Realize that when you're in the operating room, sometimes that isn't the case, but that's the answer for this purpose of this test. Another question might be with nerve supply, which muscle does not have its nerve supply come from inside the muscle cone? Superior oblique. Yeah. And, and that is useful if you're talking about doing a complex orbital dissection and somebody's thinking around somewhere and you're worrying about not denervating a muscle. Otherwise, when you're reaching back in the orbit with retractors and hooks and various things, you can catch blood vessels and, uh, you know, or if you were trying to do a procedure that I don't think ever should be done in humans, but called denervation and extirpation of the inferior oblique that some people think is a good thing to do, you need to know where the nerve supply to the inferior oblique is to destroy it. Um, I'm not sure it's really offended me enough to destroy it, but some people don't agree. Now, the distance that the muscles are from the limbus, their insertion typically, and these are based on population studies where multiple things are measured, does show up at times. Um, and this difference in distance going around from medial to superior rectus going from about five and a half to almost eight um, is called the spiral of Tolo that does show up. Um, and the other thing that is uh, useful in your understanding and of practical significance is this issue of the difference between the visual axis and the angle that these muscles, the vertical rectus, superior and inferior rectus make, and then the inferior oblique, which comes from the floor of the orbit up under the lateral rectus here and inserts posteriorly, and the superior oblique. And the superior oblique, inferior oblique make an angle of 51 degrees with this visual axis, and the rectus muscles 23 degrees. More importantly, when you turn the eye out, if you would see here just a bit, bring the visual axis out this way, abduct the eye, you're going to be more lined up with the vertical rectus muscles. And when you abduct the eye, you're more lined up with the obliques. That is the reason when we talk about diagnostic positions of gaze, that we're talking about the abducted eye separating the vertical function of the obliques, the abducted eye vertical function of the rectus muscles. And as far as another, you know, common question might be which muscle has the longest tendon? That would be the superior oblique. Which one has the shortest tendon? Inferior oblique, usually no tendon at all. Um, and which ones originate from the annulus of Zen? This table is taken right out of the home study course book. And I, I think it is useful. The other thing that is useful over here are the primary, secondary, and tertiary functions, uh, realizing that with the oblique muscles, the primary functions are the cyclorotatory functions. And one way I you know, try to remember this, if you remember that both of the oblique muscles, superior and inferior oblique, abduct the vertical rectus muscles, superior and inferior rectus, adduct, and the muscles on top of the eye, both superior oblique um, and uh, um, superior rectus are in cyclotorters, and the uh, uh, inferior muscles are excyclotorters. And 
you know, because there will be could be a question conceivably asking you about that. We're thinking about these planes of or axes of effect are totally bogus, except that it does give us a way to think about you know ways that the eye rotates, but knowing that one's x, one's y, and one's z has never really helped me take care of a patient. The way one way to remember this is x kind of like a cross goes across and y comes out at you and the z is the other one um, and but using that like pitch roll and yaw you can describe any movement of the globe basically and i think this is useful for example if we're talking about shifting the medial and lateral rectus muscles for an eye that's hypotropic and what we're going to do is rotate the eye around this x axis this axis to rotate it up by shifting the muscles horizontally, the horizontal muscles vertically, and displacing them. And so I think it is useful to think about that, uh, but eyes don't come with those labels. And then quickly, as far as ductions, ductions are monocular movements of an eye, adduction, abduction, superduction, infraduction, and you can also have X cyclo and in cyclo uh, 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 rotations called extorsion or X cycloduction, in cycloduction. And as far as binocular movements, we have movements of the same, the both eyes in the same direction, dextro and levo version, up gaze, down gaze, and then movements that are not in the same direction, convergence and divergence, convergence being an active, uh, uh, you know, uh, a thing and then divergence just basically for most uh, animal species being the absence of convergence not an active process there's no center in the brain that I'm aware of that subserves divergence now what about Herring's law what does that tell us basically tells us that the yoke muscles the muscles that move both eyes in the same direction. So if my eyes are looking off to my right, my right lateral rectus, right medial rectus, get the same amount of innervation. Why is that? It, it explains a bunch of things. First of all, we use that at times to try to make it harder for one eye to move to increase the nerve, the innervational input to the other eye. Posterior fixation suture or just simply weakening the muscle will do that to try to get a lateral rectus that is paretic. Uh, you know, from a sixth nerve palsy to work better, to increase range of binocularity. That works there. And the other place that this plays a role are in primary and secondary deviations. Nico, what's the primary deviation? Um, Which eye are you fixing with? Uh, you're fixing with the, uh, with the eye. With the sound eye, that's correct. Secondary deviation is the paretic eye. So if I have a right sixth nerve palsy, when I fix with my left eye, I've got a relatively small amount of esotropia, right? But when I fix with my right eye, it requires a huge amount of effort to keep that eye straight. That same effort goes to my left medial rectus, which is why the secondary deviation is always larger than the primary deviation. That's, how, that's one of the ways you can tell that you're dealing with one of two things. What's the other thing that'll cause a picture that looks just like that, Chris? You're increasing innervational input because it's really hard to keep the eyes straight. Let's say I had had facial trauma. Outside of restriction? Yeah, exactly. And I had a medial wall blow up. And, you know, I may not have muscle trapped. It may just be that I've got scar tissue from bleeding in the orbit. But bottom line is that you can't separate those two exactly just based on primary and secondary deviations. And we'll see this with restrictive changes in Graves' disease. You know, if I've got a tight inferior rectus on the right side, and I'm trying to look here, you know, my left eye will be way up at the ceiling. And if uh, um, I fix with the left eye, I'm gonna have a little bit of a right hypotropia. And, and so you see the same sort of phenomenon. And when you see eyes that are misaligned, and they show you this in OCAPS, always ask yourself the question, which eye is the problem? 
because it isn't always obvious. If they're fixing with the paretic eye, the sound eye can do all kinds of goofy things. They're probably not going to show you that, no caps, uh, but possible. Now, Sherrington's law, on the other hand, basically says that when antagonist muscles are involved, like my right lateral, right medial rectus muscle, when I abduct my right eye, I get increased innervational input to the lateral and decreased to its antagonist muscle, the muscle that pulls against it. That's important. What's the classic example of a situation where this does not occur? Planes, absolutely. Ding, 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 you get that question right. And this, I mentioned earlier, the idea, and you say, well, I always thought that th this is pretty diagnostic looking up and down, but when you're looking up and you're looking down, you've got both the superior rectus and inferior oblique elevating the eye, inferior rectus, superior oblique depressing the eye, so you cannot separate those functions. Whereas when we look here and we're looking up and right, the major elevator of this left eye is the inferior oblique, major elevator is the superior rectus. Those sorts of questions do show up from time to time. Worth knowing about that. Again, the depressors here on my left eye, down and right, and this is as you look at the patient, like when we're not as the patient is looking at their visual field, you're basically looking at the patient describing what this is just what you see as you look at them. The major depressor and abduction is superior oblique. The major depressor and abduction is inferior rectus. And, and horizontally, it's darn straightforward. But the reason they call these diagnostic positions, in each of these six fields, there is one muscle that is the major mover of the eye in that direction, and you're looking at the function of that muscle. Now, sensory physiology, we're gonna kind of cruise through this, but questions do show up about this, about retinal correspondence, the horopter, which is of probably no other practical significance in this Wieff Mueller circle, certainly of no other practical significance. Fusion is worth considering, and it does play a role, particularly in sorting out how long one has had strabismus and in deciding what to do with adults with strabismus to not give them terminal diplopia. Um, now, this is this picture again from the home study course, and this patient is looking at this point, F. And relative to that, there is a, you know, if everything this is called the empirical horopter, this uh, thing here, and or this Beef Mueller's circle. And the idea is that on this circle, everything, every point along there, while you're looking at F, is going to be perceived and, and fall on corresponding areas in the retina in each eye. And so the idea is that anything on that plane, and it's basically not just a line, it is a surface, is going to appear to be single. It turns out, on the other hand, there's this thing called panum space, and there have been questions before about this, and the question might be, if you're looking at object F and something is here or here, how does the patient perceive it? The idea is that in this space, if you're looking, and only if you're looking at F, because this only exists relative to that circumstance, anything that you see that isn't exactly on this plane is going to be perceived to have stereo. Anything outside it is going to be perceived to be double relative to this point F. You can kind of see, and, and one, of, one of the things you want to uh, look at here is as you get farther from fixation, that space widens out quite a bit where you can see something and it'll look like it has depth and not appear to be double. If you take a piece of wire coat hanger, and you look at something like the tip of a pencil and you take the coat hanger and you go back and forth, you'll see that the coat hanger looks single, then it looks double, then it looks you know single and double again. And you'll see, you can tell that it looks like it's farther away or closer than what you're looking at. And if you do it out here, it takes longer to get through that area. I mean, so this actually works. And is it of practical significance? It probably explains to some extent 
why, when you look at patients in my clinic and they are not perfectly straight, they're straight give or take a little, and they've got stereopsis, they're not complaining of diplopia, and they're happy. You say, well, I thought we had to get their eyes absolutely perfectly straight. And the answer to that question is, we'd like them to be perfectly straight, but really what we're doing is getting them in a range where they can comfortably use their horizontal, vertical, and torsional fusion mechanisms, their, eye, their ability to take an image and put the image together to do that comfortably and consistently so they can function. And then we've done our job. In kids, it has to be close enough that they don't develop amblyopia. Now, interrupt if there are questions about any of this. You know, these are things that, again, one of the, my philosophy on why you take OCAPs is that it causes you to kind of collect all this information. You've been things you've been reading about. If you haven't been reading regularly, you are in deep stuff. Uh, but uh, because that's something that you need to be doing. But bottom line is that uh, it causes you to collect, you know, all this information, kind of organize your thoughts about it. And you do that once a year, and I think you turn out to be a better ophthalmologist. Now, retinal correspondence refers to, you know, the idea is that there are points in each retina that relate at a cortical level to each other. If the situation is that things that should relate in right eye to things in the left eye, then we have a situation of normal retinal correspondence. And if you grow up with a straight eyes, normal visual system, that is the circumstance. Anything else that involves anomalous retinal correspondence, whether it's harmonious or non-harmonious, and we'll talk about that, implies that you had early childhood strabismus because that is the only circumstance where you can develop anomalous retinal correspondence. So there might be a question that pertains to that. And we're gonna look at this just a bit more. Other issues, we're gonna talk about suppression. Um, suppression refers to the phenomenon, which is good if there was nothing we could do about strabismus, amblyopia and the like, where in infancy again, and in, in childhood, while the visual system is developing, you ignore enough information from one eye to not see uh, a double. And that allows one to function and allowed one hopefully to you know, catch another mammoth, woolly mammoth or dinosaur or something and survive and, and pass that on. Uh, uh, but in monofixation, on the other hand, refers to a specific circumstance where you have subtle abnormalities in binocularity usually very, very small angle strabismus. It may be small enough that you cannot even see it on cover testing, but um, it is a stable arrangement. And when we're talking about operating on children with infantile esotropia, infantile exotropia, this is the most likely desirable outcome. Rarely do we ever get those kids so they have straight eyes, normal binocularity, the usual outcome is monofixation syndrome with good vision in each eye. And that, that has shown up as a question on OCAPs before. Now, Nico, what if I wanted to test Becca for monofixation syndrome? She came in, let's see, she had mild amblyopia in one eye. And her eyes looked perfectly straight. And she didn't have anisometropia. And you're saying, gosh, when I was on peds, I learned that I'm supposed to come to some resolution as to how she developed amblyopia. How, what, what test, quick and dirty test you can do in any exam room as long as you have a box of prisms? Well, I was thinking of Lure 4 dot first. Lure 4 dot, if you do that test with the little teeny ones and you get far away and one of them disappears and you have a very observant patient, will work. But let's say... Let's, let's do a stretch here. Let's say she is a five-year-old. I'll make her a five-year-old. Four diopter base out prism. And a four diopter base out prism test, what you're doing is you're just displacing the image on the fovea of the eye that you're placing it in front of. So while the patient is fixing, if I have monofixation syndrome, and I've got a microtropia, I've got a little area that I'm suppressing in one eye. When I move the prism in front of, there are two things. 
normal situation, move that forward and after base out prism in front of one eye, you're gonna see a version movement. Both eyes are gonna to move to pick up this new object, right? And then this eye, you're gonna realize, hey, I'm, I'm not looking at that, and you're gonna see a vergence movement. And so you wanna look for both of those things, version and then the vergence movement to have both eyes looking at the same thing. So that when I put this, let's say this eye is got a suppression scotoma. I move the prism here, I'm gonna see the version, but I'm not gonna see the versions. Let's, now when I put it in front of this eye, because there's a suppression scotoma here, and that's only there when I am binocular. When I do visual field testing, there's nothing wrong, right? I move it here, there's no movement at all. And that test actually works very well, but it is absolutely essential that you have a relatively small target because you gotta make the target disappear. You know, it's gotta be inside the, less than the size of their suppressing scotoma in a four diopter base out prism test, and that test works. Um, and so that, uh, it's my favorite test to do for that, but you're right, if you do these, use the, there is a version of the, not the regular Worth 4 dot, the Worth 4 dot, named after a guy named Claude Worth, who was a famous, you know, um, strabismologist uh, of long ago, um, is it, we'll talk about, it's a test of binocularity, not stereopsis. And with the regular uh, um, size uh, spots, you really, what you can do is you can walk to the end of the room with that. And the farther you get away from the patient, suddenly they start suppressing one eye. And that will work, that's good. You get points for that. I'm not sure that would be the right answer on the test. It might be both of those things. Um, and then the other, this is a key kind of concept that you have to use to understand what patients are experiencing. And it is worth spending just a moment kind of thinking through and also will play a key role in those goofy pictures from the Baglini lenses, which are only pertinent to residents and OCAPs. And the other issue are the after image test things because they're talking about two different things. The idea is which way things move when they become doubled, when you're esotropic or exotropic. And you need to be able to think through this and remember, I wouldn't memorize it. I mean, you can memorize it. It's, you know, it's not a lot of information, but the idea is that if my right eye is esotropic and I am looking here at Nico, Nico's image, my left eye is gonna be on the fovea, isn't it? And some of the area around it um, because the image of Nico is going to be a little larger than my fovea. But the bottom line is that in my right eye, it's going to be on nasal retina. Normally, when I am looking at something with a fovea, everything in nasal retina subserves temporal space. Everything on the temporal, temporal to the fovea, and you have to keep this in mind, not the optic nerve, the fovea, that's the zero point, temporal retina, nasal visual space. So that if my retinas are still working together normally, I have normal retinal correspondence, and I'm esotropic, Nico falls on the nasal retina, which tells me he's over here. Now that's why with esotropia, you wind up with un, what's called uncrossed diplopia. Nico's image, if I turn my right eye in, the image from my right eye is going to move over here. Contrast that, I'm now exotropic, okay? And I'm looking at Mike over here, and bottom line is when I'm exotropic, he falls on temporal retina, which is gonna tell me that he's over here, so Mike's image is gonna, from my right eye, is gonna move over here, it's crossed, okay? As opposed to uncrossed esotropia, crossed exotropia, Anybody not get that? Because that is going to be key to some things we're talking about. You need to, if it's, you know, talk to me later. We'll draw pictures and make it make sense. Because otherwise, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes here isn't going to make a lot of sense to you. And there usually are questions about this on this test. Now, let's look at levels of binocularity and sidestep for a second. And there's sort of three levels uh, 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 are things we're talking about here. One is simultaneous perception. I'm seeing something at the same time out of two eyes. 
in fairly dense amblyopia, you can do that. The other is I can take the two images and put them together. And the third is I can tell subtle differences in where things are in space, stereopsis. Now in this picture here, there's nothing that is at all similar here or here, but if the chickens look like they're behind the chicken wire, I'm seeing both of those images, simultaneous perception. Here, there are differences in the two pictures, and if I can make it like this, I've fused those two images to make them one. I've had to overlap the ship in one with the other, the elephant in one with the other, and yet I'm picking up this and this that are different in the two pictures. On the other hand, if I present something where something is offset here and perceive it as being raised coming out of the page, I have stereo. And in this, sometimes there are questions about this in terms of the anatomy of the uh, um, system that helps perceive this. And when we look at this, we have these different, you know, it's magnocellular and parvocellular, you know, systems that have to do with different parts of our, our vision. And that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're reviewing here this morning, but it's worth being aware of that at least. Now, Nico mentioned the, what I affectionately in clinic call the worthless four dot test. Basically the worth four dot test is mainly used by people to show parents that they've done something wonderful for their kids when they've operated on them because most kids after surgery will be able to say, yeah, I'm binocular. And it's, it's, a, it's a test to say you're using both eyes, but I've not found that it gives me a lot of useful information. The Bagolini lenses, Bruno Bagolini was an Italian ophthalmologist, made these striated glasses. And the glasses, the lenses are, with the striations, oriented a certain way. You always put them in front the same way. There is one, I have one if you want to play with it and use, what you do is use the transilluminator light and look at it. And similar to the Maddox rod uh, that you have in clinic and use for double Maddox rod testing, you can use uh, the Bagolini lenses and looking at where that pinpoint of light is, if the patient sees one light, they're binocular, they're, they're, they're not, you know, their eyes are lined up uh, usually. Um, and if they have diplopia, the position of the one from the right and the left eye sometimes give you information about whether they're esotropic or exotropic. For my money, you're better looking at the patient, cover testing and measuring it. That's what we do. You know, if you're trying to look at Shopco in the eye department, that test might be useful, like the red glass test is where you hold a red lens in front of one eye, shine the light, and see where the white light and the red light are. And again, we see patients come in with that. I would urge you to go beyond that. And we're gonna look at that Bagolini lens thing as it, as it appears in, in the test you're gonna take. After image testing is actually a very cool test. It takes a long filament in a long skinny light bulb and you put a piece of tape around the middle with a dot on it and you ask the patient to look at it. One eye holding it vertical, one eye holding it horizontal. What you're doing is labeling the, the fovea in each eye, assuming the patient sees with each eye. You're, you're saying, I'm gonna tag the fovea here, I'm gonna tag the fovea here, and then with both eyes open and they have the after image from that, I'm gonna ask the patient where those things are in relation to each other and get useful information, which is different than this Baglini lens test where the patient has both eyes open, they're looking simultaneously, and we're talking about generally whether they have uncrossed or crossed diplopia which is the way to answer those tests, and we're gonna look at that. The amblyoscope is a very elaborate device that allows you to directly measure horizontal, vertical, and torsional diplopia. I think there is one in the Moran graveyard, uh, but we do not use it. You will likely never seen it used in our clinic, although Julie may, if I can find it, resurrect it, just so you can all see what it looks like. Um, Dr. Dries recently had a patient where he thought it might be helpful. So I'm gonna see if it's not been sent to the scrap heap. I once threatened to use it for an anchor for my boat. Um, 
And so we've talked about this, and uh, this is uh, Ilda Capo. She is the Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology at Baskin Palmer. This was when she was, a, I think, a fellow with my buddy Debbie Elkhorn at uh, Wilmer, and she posed in this uh, for this picture that then Dr. Guyton published. Um, you put the red lens before the right eye, green lens before the left, and then you look at this at combination of uh, two green, one red, one white light. And if you see four lights, you're normal. If you see two red, you're suppressing the green. If you see three green, the white will look green. You're suppressing the right eye. And that may be a question about that. And if you see five dots, um, the patient is the pulpic. And um, if they have something that doesn't add up to five dots um, and they're seeing more than four dots, the patient is crazy. Um, or they're just jerking you around or they can't count. Uh, but at that point, you're not gonna get a lot of useful information from that test. Now there's Baglini lens test. Um, and, and this is basically the normal situation. This black dot refers to the tip of the transilluminator light as you're looking at it. And so what we're looking at here is this pattern, and this is the right eye, the, the right where the right eye, uh, uh, the striations. So the striations are actually going this way to give you this similar to what happens with your you know, Maddox rod and uh, vice versa for the left eye. Normal situation, if we have a tiny suppression scotoma, monofixation with one eye, you may have a very observant patient that can tell you there's a little break in the line. I've never found that to be a useful test personally. And if you've got normal retinal core, and this also is with normal retinal correspondence. Now, let's say we're esotropic, um, and we're gonna pop down to this because these are the ones that they usually get you on. Notice here with esotropia, the image to the right eye is shifted to the right, the image to the left eye shifted to the left. That is uncrossed or crossed? Uncrossed, right? And we just said for esotropia, you can uncross diplopia. So that look at where those are and you can answer that. And the same here, um, the, the idea is that the image for the right is over on the left. The one on the left is over on the right. It's crossed. This is exotropia. When I was a resident, I spent a fair amount of time trying to make some significance out of whether these lines intersected above or below where the dots were. And it turns out that's of actually no significance at all, uh, but there you are. And I didn't have anybody to tell me that this was just due to crossed or uncrossed diplopia. So if you remember that concept, which is why I mentioned it, you'll make sense of these. And now if you've got a large suppression scotoma, you can see something like this. If you suppress all of one eye, you may see something like this. This test, there's a reason that it's not widely used. You know, it's difficult to administer and interpret. Dr. Bagolini used it extensively, but I'm not sure that outside of his close circle in Italy, it received widespread acceptance. He was a very, uh, you know, a, a smart, capable uh, pediatric ophthalmologist kind of at the time. Actually, wasn't a pediatric, he was a, interested in strabismus um, long before there was anything called a pediatric ophthalmologist. Now, after image testing, again, um, we do have one. If you have it, please let me know because it has disappeared. If you see it, it looks like a long fluorescent light tube with a cord coming out of it. You plug it in. It used to light up when I saw it last, and it's kind of fun to play with, um, but that's the extent of it. And so with this again, this is a different concept than crossed and uncrossed diplopia. And, and the question might be, and this, and this is where they get you, the answer, you know, you remember what we're doing is we're tagging the phobia in one eye and we're tagging the phobia in the other eye. The question often is the patient's got 65 diopters of esotropia, 10 diopters of right hypertropia, and 15 degrees of excyclotorsion and you do after image testing, what does the picture look like? And guess what? No matter what the information they give you, if the patient has normal retinal correspondence, this is what they're gonna think one phobia is doing relative to the other. 
doesn't matter what their misalignment is. I mean, they're going to beat the fovic to beat the band, but when you label the fovea in one eye and you ask the patient where the fovea is in relation to the other eye, they're going to put those, their brain's still going to put those images together and it's going to look like this. That question has shown up. Now, it gets a little tricky here and you have to think back to what we went through to make sense of crossed and uncrossed diplopia. And it has to do with where the fovea thinks it is. Let's say I am esotropic and I've labeled the fovea in my right eye, but I have a pseudofovea, the thing that is looking at the object of regard, which is now in nasal retina, right? What that makes my fovea now, the true fovea, which I've labeled, it thinks it's part of temporal retina. And you have to use that to go back to that analogy that the temporal retina has to do with things in the nasal side, right? And things in the nasal side, you know, so that basically what it's going to do is it's going to do just the opposite of what happens with the uncrossed and crossed diplopia. And that's where these things come from. And you need to sit down, think about that, make sense of it. If it isn't making sense, we can kind of draw it out together. So you're asking where the true phobia thinks it is relative to the real, you know, the, the, the pseudo phobia. That's a term that I've made up to try to make sense of this. Um, and this only occurs, this only occurs in the face of anomalous retinal correspondence where things are not relating as they were at the get-go. Otherwise, this will be the answer. And, and this, yes? Question, in this, in this test, does the distance of the target matter? Um, the target is, is it really doesn't in, in that, I mean, the way people do it is they just hold it right here and they say stare at, what you do is you say stare at this, you have them look at it for like 30 seconds, then you look here for 30 seconds and you say, what do you see? And, and so I don't, I, I think if it got, yeah, you could, if you had a suppression scotoma, you're correct. But I don't think anybody has used this test to try to detect suppression. And in fact, I don't think anybody, you know, the people that did this mainly were thought this, uh, who were at Wilmer, who had maybe three patients a day that Dr. Guyton was seeing because he spent all day seeing them. And that's what he does. And Dave's a wonderful guy, but he doesn't see a lot of patients. And he's one of these really smart guys, scary smart. I think you met David Guyton. His dad was the guy that wrote Guyton's Physiology. And he is a scary smart guy, but he doesn't see a lot of patients. Um, it's kind of like the pediatric ophthalmology version of neuro ophthalmology clinic gone wild. And uh, it is, uh, but this is something that's useful just to think through um, so you can make sense of it. Now, the other thing we didn't talk about with this was this issue, and I may come to this, I can't remember if it's in the slide setup, but harmonious, non-harmonious, anomalous retinal correspondence. Let's say I measure with the amblyoscope that my eyes think that I'm 30 prism diopters esotropic from a sensory standpoint, where my brain thinks it is. And when I do cover testing, I'm 30 prism diopters esotropic. That's called harmonious. But if there is a difference in the two, from a sensory standpoint, I'm 20 diopters ET. When I measure it with prism and cover testing, I'm 40 prism diopters ET. That would be non-harmonious. And what that usually implies is that somewhere in development, alignment changed. We did surgery, they got glasses, their eyes were straighter for a while. <clears throat> and so they grew up in two different regimes as far as ocular alignment. And that's where non-harmonious ARC comes from, develops over time. Now the test of stereopsis, titmus test, watch for monocular clues, Grab a titmus test in clinic, the one with the dots and the fly. Look at it with one eye and see how many of them you can get asking the question, which one looks different. 
Then if you take the book and you hold the book as you're looking at it with the circles, you turn the book upside down, you'll notice that the dot that looks like it's stuck up now looks like it sticks in. If a patient can tell you that without you prompting them, they've got true stereopsis with that test. That's a way, practical way that won't be on this test to sort that out. But otherwise, monocular clues, the, the smart kid who's asking the, answering the question, which one looks different? Because we ask that question all the time of children. Randot, which uses a different methodology, there are still some monocular clues just because of the way things are printed, but it isn't, uh, and this is the titmus test, uh, and this is the, uh, the boat anchor, the amblyoscope. It looks like a research device. Notice the old time switches and knobs. I don't think anyone has made one of those things in 50 years. Um, they're, they're not manufactured anymore and no one uses them practically. It takes forever to use it. It doesn't add a lot to change patient care. Now, what about amblyopia? You need to know, yeah, two to 4%, depending on estimates, the population, and you could conceivably get a question because now there's a big push from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, American Academy of Pediatrics on uh, pre-verbal amblyopia screening. And the question is, what is it based on? Might ask a question about that. And it is not based on uh, asking, you know, measuring visual acuity. It is based on looking for amblyogenic factors. So you don't directly measure amblyopia. Whereas if we're measuring visual acuity in a six-year-old, you find out that vision is 2020 and 2400 best corrected. You're directly measuring their amblyopia, the degree of amblyopia. In pre-verbal screening, what you, you're, most of these devices have something that will give you some sort of autorefraction and some sense of ocular alignment, media opacity, some things of that sort, things that could cause amblyopia, amblyogenic factors. And I think that is important and it's now being recommended down to age one. And so every primary care doc, and what has driven this, unfortunately, the same thing that drives many things in medicine, and that is someone developed a billing code. They can bill for doing it, therefore it's become a good thing to do. Um, on the other hand, if you're talking about asking you to go out as a pediatrician and buy a, a, you know, a eight or $10,000 device, that you can't get any reimbursement for just because it's good for your patients. Or they could take their family to Disney World. Uh, they're gonna go to Disney World every time. Uh, and so they needed one. Now, strabismic, amblyopia that develops because of misalignment of the eyes, ignoring diplopia, developing a suppression scotoma, anisometropia. This is the circumstance where we have straight eyes, big difference in refractive error, one eye compared to the other. And that is something that is the most commonly missed. And what has really driven this early childhood screening that for bilateral or amotropic amblyopia, large hyperopia, astigmatism. For those of you who've been down to the Navajo reservation with us um, in the Southwestern Native American population, there is huge refractive error usually combinations of myopia and astigmatism. And so a lot of these children will have amotropic amblyopia. The thing that's surprising to me, and Chris and Nico, you guys have been down there with this, I think the, the, the idea is that why don't more of them have it? Because some of them actually function fairly well despite having huge amounts of astigmatism. So there's some piece of that puzzle that we're not still quite understanding that I'm gonna need your all help to sort out. A couple of concepts. First of all, deprivation is the other kind, but this crowding phenomenon, what's that referred to? That shows up as a question at times in some way. The idea with crowding phenomenon is a physiologic you know, observation that in terms of visual, visual physiology, system physiology, if you present single optotypes to an amblyopic eye, they will do better on the eye chart than if you present linear, multiple figures, optotypes, the little individual figures on, on an eye chart. And so 
we, you know, you always want to present linear figures or use those surround bars that you'll see on the HOTB test. And most of you uh, now uh, were brought up, I suppose, all using projected charts. Most of you don't have uh, wall charts or anything that you're measuring patients on. Um, so that you want to be sure, I mean, my take home message for you for this is know what the people who are measuring acuity for you are using. They are representing you, and if they're not doing what you need done, it is easier with a four-year-old to take individual pictures, and they go down and they miss amblyopia. So if they're going to do that, use the surround bars, and I think we may have a picture of that here somewhere. We'll kind of Actually, we may not, but they're basically the little bars that occur around the optotype. You'll see those on the MS systems. Um, they're, once you get to that, you can put those on there, and I'd urge you to use that because you will miss less. It simulates linear optotypes. So you want to eliminate the causes. You want to achieve equal, clearly focused images. Do either occlusion or penalization. There are new things that probably won't show up on OCAPS, but you'll hear about uh, using stimulation of both eyes and various sorts of circumstances to treat amblyopia. Exciting stuff. Um, and um, that is something, though, that is coming, probably not to show up in a test like this, though, at the moment. And um, now let's run through strabismus, terminology, types of deviations, and whatnot and this angle cap of things so that you can figure out the answer because there is often a question about that and a question about the three-step test. So as far as terminology, ET, XT, you know, right hypertropia, RHT, left hypertropia, they'll write out the word hypo. If there's parenthesis around the T, what does that imply? An intermittent deviation. And uh, what about angle kappa? What's that all about? If there's displacement of the fovea, making it look like the patient is strabismic, and the classic and the way I would remember that is in ROP, the fovea is almost always dragged temporally, simulating. Now, if I drag my fovea temporally, my eye is going to turn out like this to put that temporally dragged fovea looking right here at Nico, isn't it? And so it looks like, and I have seen kids, post-premature kids, more than several, that look like their eyes are looking east and west if they've had dragging of the retina in both eyes. But when you do cover testing, they're moving out like this to pick up fixation. So they're, from a motor standpoint, alignment standpoint, they're esotropic. From an appearance standpoint, they already look funny and their eyes are turned out. And, and so when you talk to parents and say, well, I could give her a little better chance of using the two eyes together if we made her eyes straighter this way, but it's gonna make her look real funny. And they never opt for that, uh, smart parents. But it's really funny how that works. And so the thing you don't wanna do is look at that post premature kid and say, well, obviously the eyes are turned out. They look like they're turned out to me, and I'm going to straighten them out because you're going to make the patient worse from the standpoint of the esotropia, and you're likely going to cause them to lose vision as a result. They're going to develop amblyopia. That's one of the reasons that we wait and we look and measure and remeasure and make sure we know what the heck's going on. Three-step test will go through if it doesn't show up here in the next few slides here. Now, infantile esotropia, accommodative, paretic, and other, and this includes Duane's, all of these issues, and let's, an intermittent exotropia. Now, exotropia, let's back up for, well, intermittent XT, infantile, infantile exotropia, similar to infantile ET, both of these disorders have large angle misalignment showing up in the first six months of life. They don't have significant refractive error, probably due to a failure in the process of acquiring binocularity, and they benefit from early surgery and getting some sort of stable alignment, but you cannot make it as if they never had the problem. 
Then sensory deviations we're going to talk about just a little bit as well here. Vertical deviations, when you're thinking through this, think about dissociated vertical deviation, thyroid, oblique dysfunction, and then the role of the vertical muscles in A and V patterns, mainly the superior oblique and inferior oblique. Now, how do we separate dissociated vertical deviation, this up, up, down, from a true hyper deviation? With a true hyper, you're going to have a hyper-hypo relationship. When I go from one eye to the other, I'm going to do this. And if you don't see a true hyper-hypo relationship where we alternate when we're doing our cover testing, all I see is I go from this side to this side, I'm seeing this happen, this happen. And if you look carefully, you will often see a little excyclo and a little exo movement as well. This is what's called dissociated strabismus complex. All three of those things are part of this. Mike Brodsky's related DVD um, to, and he's at Mayo now, was in, in, in Oklahoma, the dorsal writing reflex in fish. He's another one of these scary smart guys like Dave Guyton who sits and thinks about things. And um, it makes sense to him. I've listened to him talk about it several times, and I still can't quite get on board with it, but he thinks it's really cool. So worth reading about. Now, let's look at some things here for show and tell. Um, and I want to go through these. What's this patient have? Type of deviation? Esotropia. Which eye is fixing? So this would be right esotropia. And let's look here, and then we're going to look here. Now, what's this patient have? Exotropia. You look at where the corneal light reflex is, is, is shifted, and you can't tell which eye. I mean, you say, does a patient have INO or a third nerve palsy? Well, they could, but um, nothing to support a third nerve palsy. And without looking at movements and the speed of saccades and that, you can't tell. Wait a second. Let's go back here. Now, this patient, on the other hand, if you look carefully, let's hear a list of things. What's wrong with this patient? Just describe what you see. Hypo versus right hypo. Right, yeah, left hypo. And the left eye, I think, is also a little exo. Is the lid down a little bit? Is there a little bit of anisocoria? Okay, and so can you put that together? Third nerve palsy. So this is a third nerve palsy. This is a kid with a brain tumor. Okay, so this is the, the right answer and for this kid would have been to get an urgent neuro uh, in an imaging study, which was actually done the day this photo was taken, um, and then the kid was turned over to neurosurgery and the oncology services. Um, this is classic, this is a beautiful picture of an intermittent deviation. Straight eyes top, ET, right ET here at the bottom, after the cover is removed. So this isn't a phoria. Remember, phoria, my eyes are misaligned only when I prevent binocularity. This is an intermittent tropia because her eyes became misaligned, and when you take the cover away, they stay crossed for a bit, and then she'll straighten out. And um, so that is, an, an intermittent esotropia is not that common a problem, whereas intermittent exotropia, as you're already aware, is probably the most common or second more, most common you know, type of strabismus that we deal with here. Uh, all across, almost everywhere you go in Asia, intermittent dextropia is by far the most common type of deviation, hands down. I mean, you'll see 10 intermittent, or 50, maybe 15 or 20 intermittent, intermittent dext patients for every patient with accommodative ET or infantile ET. There are regional differences. When I was a fellow in Indiana, we saw tons of kids with infantile esotropia. Most of the esotropes in our practice here are accommodative ET. Why, I am not sure. Probably not good to be in Indiana. Now this patient is the patient that gets sent in because of this difference in the appearance of the two eyes. Wide intercanthal distance, and <coughs> we have the same child later without the appearance of pseudoesotropia and still having perfectly straight eyes. If you look at this patient, you could look at corneal light reflex testing. More elegantly, you could look at the Bruckner test, simultaneous red reflex assessment, which would be symmetric. 
you could do cover testing, all of which will be normal. So this is a problem with looking crossed and how the child looks. And the ch you don't get that sense, that gestalt, that the eyes are still crossed when you look. And this is the angle kappa issue that we mentioned. We'll go beyond that. And this is this red lens test that I talked about that they do at Shopco in the eye department. And you look here and what the child sees is this white light from one eye, the red line. And if the red is before the right eye and it's shifted off to the right side, are they ET or XT? ET, right? It's uncrossed diplopia. And if it's off to the left side, it's crossed. And you can use it to sort that out. But you have better means at your disposal. Where something like this might be helpful is when you see the patient after the adult patient after cataract surgery and they're complaining of double vision, you do cover testing, you look at them, you don't see anything going on. I mean, what I do with those patients is I put a little bit of vertical prism because usually it's vertical prism and you put a little bit base down, put a little bit base up and suddenly they say, ah, oh, that's it. No more double vision. And you know which way it was off because subtle vertical changes often do to some sort of toxicity of an injected anesthetic with the inferior rectus muscle, usual culprit. This is the HESS screen where you can map out um, the uh, uh, deviation that ran off with my um, link, the, 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 the equipment for this. And I've never seen it since, and she denies any knowledge of it. So I don't think that one's going to surface. It's probably in somebody's office. And this is, this is an after image tester. And you look at this right here, you look at this, and this is, you know, about as large as it looks when it's the right distance from you, Nico. And it's a, it occupies a lot of visual space. Now this is, what's our concern going to be? What is this? First of all, yeah, that's a capillary hemangioma. Would you be worried about this and want to do something with it? Okay, and what is the best current treatment option for this child? What's that? Beta blocker. Beta blocker. And what do you want to make sure that this child doesn't have so you do not kill the child when you institute the beta blockers? Facing syndrome know about that. that. That could potentially show up in this circumstance because that's one of those things where if they've got that, and if they've got that, that what you need to do is you probably need to get pediatric cardiology involved. Uh, it's going to be cardiac death. And so the idea is that what we do here, we have a system that was set up by one of our dermatologists in conjunction with ER docs and uh, um, Susan Etheridge from pediatric cardiology to admit kids and rapidly get them up to speed on systemic beta blockers. You can also use topical beta blockers if it's a period, but this thing's got enough thickness that for my money, you know, you, you want to be on a propranolol and it is a magic bull. I mean, these things shrink. The idea is, and, and as far as ways this can cause amblyopia, the obvious one is that it's blocking vision. But the other ways, if it extends into the orbit, it can cause a hypotropia. So misalignment of the eyes. It also can push on the eye, usually causing astigmatism, so anisometropia. So always, 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 you see a kid with something like this, refract them. Now this kid, this is a child who's got esotropia. He's straight in the glasses. What's your diagnosis? Okay, now, looking at this picture, the question might be, what is the appropriate surgical procedure initially? And the answers might be, let's say they give you A, medial rectus recession, both eyes, B, recess resect procedure for estropia, left eye, C, lateral rectus resection, both eyes, or D, no surgery is appropriate at this time. Which is, what's the answer? D. Yeah, no surgery. Why? Well, the patient's eyes are straight with the glasses. That's what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and they will try to trip you up with things like that. Um, now, this patient has a high ACA ratio, high ratio of accommodative convergence to accommodation, meaning that when they accommodate, 
for an object at near, they get more convergence per unit of focusing, per diopter of focusing. Ordinarily, you focus about three diopters to focus on things at near. You should get just enough convergence to allow you to keep both eyes looking at what you're looking at. If you get excess convergence, what happens is you wind up with extra esotropia like this patient has here through the top of the glasses, and the eyes are much straighter through this cheap, I was made at J.C. Penney's executive bifocal. Don't ever do that to a patient. That's a terrible thing to do with a patient. Um, this patient has equal vision. You can see he's fixing right eye, fixing left eye, alternating esotropia. What would be the best initial surgical procedure? Yes. And so what you want to do with that question is you want to eliminate, first of all, the ones that would move the eye in the wrong direction. When they say lateral rectus recession, both eyes, that would win a quick trip to risk management and a write out the check kind of a situation. Um, that would not be good. Um, and they might have, you know, inferior oblique myectomy, both eyes, or superior oblique tuck. Um, but you want to find something that A, makes sense, and then figure out which ones could potentially work and say, which would be the best for this? Because there may be some of those gray line kind of discussions. Now, this patient has dense amblyopia in this eye because of this, and what is this? It's a morning glory optic nerve, basically without the pigment. It's an optic nerve coloboma. So this is sensory, meaning I see poorly out of this eye, esotropia. So if they ask you for surgery on this patient, and this could be a question, the question is to make the eye look straight. First of all, you know, do you do a recess, resect procedure on this eye, or do you operate on both medial rectus muscles? Yes. The reason you limit the surgery to this eye is you've got a normally seeing left eye, and you've got an eye that might have finger counting vision in this eye, and you don't want to operate on that normal eye to subject it to even a small amount of risk. Again, now this patient. This patient has sensory esotropia, and actually this shows kind of this Bruckner test to its extreme. Um, this is what 20 diopters of uh, anisotropia looks like for this young lady who has monocular aphakia, who was kind enough to take her contact lens out for me for this photograph. This patient has poor vision in one eye, and someone recommended that they have medial rectus recession bilaterally for esotropia. Esotropia is there, and they came for you to see you for a second opinion. First of all, is everything normal as the referring doctor uh, described in the fundus? No, what's wrong? What's the diagnosis? What's wrong here? Is there anything wrong when you look at this? This looks like what the optic nerve is out here, right? Or maybe even here. But actually, it's this little nub and stuff here. This is optic nerve hypoplasia. Okay? So this raises some other issues. First of all, you know why the right eye is always the one that's turned in. Or left eye, rather. I'm sorry. Left eye is always turned in. And then the other thing, though, there's some important questions you need to ask these parents. Is the child growing normally? Have they had an MRI scan? You look for midline cranial defects. And the other thing that everybody else forgets that you need to remember is there also is an association between optic nerve hypoplasia and basal encephal seal. And I've gotten our neurosurgeons here at primary more than once on that, where I've insisted that the radiologist look for a basal encephal seal, then to see uh, uh, you know, John Kessel fixing the basal encephal seal um, and having him say, how did you know this kid had this? And it's a known association. I mean, it's not huge, but it's one of those questions to ask so that every time I see a kid with optic nerve hypoplasia, I ask them how they are doing in terms of their physical growth. If they're not where they should be on the, on the growth chart, they need to see an endocrinologist. And some of these kids, I mean, the ones that have big problems, often they come to us from endocrinology knowing that they have pen hypopituitarism, and we need to probably ramble and let you guys get on with your day. Um, the rest of this slide set Elaine has had for 
quite a while. So look through the pictures. This is a pretty picture. This is one of twins I took care of with these beautiful lens opacities. This kid, they'll show you one of these. Those are blood vessels in this white thing up against the back. The technical term for this appearance is what? Leukocoria. What's this kid have? The kid's got, got uh, this kid's got retinoblastoma. That is a group E. I'm slamming the lens right up against the cornea. And uh, I believe this child also had, uh, uh, you know, iris neovascularization. And then I became a fast specimen uh, and went to uh, the other doctor, Mammalus's lab. Um, but they're going to want, you know, a differential diagnosis. So think through a differential diagnosis for that. And now uh, this patient, this patient has a left third nerve palsy. Now, this is what you don't want to do. And, and, and somebody, you know, sent me this photo a long, long time ago. And one of the take home messages that probably won't show up on OCAPS, but when you've got a child with a congenital cranial nerve palsy, do not patch the preferred eye all day or you'll create this situation. We talked about primary and secondary deviations. And this patient has got a secondary deviation fixing with, and this is how she likes to fix with her paretic eye. And this right eye is way up here and it has 2200 best correct vision. And it was the previous normal eye. And they came to you know see somebody because they've been patched too much and suddenly, and once they switch fixation, you will never get them back. So this is the one circumstance with a congenital cranial nerve palsy where you're never going to make a binocular with a third nerve palsy. You want to patch them just enough to keep that vision reasonable. So if it were their only eye, they could function. But if you do too much patching, you're going to cause a big problem. So, you know, an hour or two a day at most and follow them closely. What's this kid have? If anybody has to run, feel free. You don't need to stay here on my account. Otherwise, I'll hang and run through a few more of these. This is this child is fixing with the right eye, large angle esotropia. He's about five months old. What's the most likely diagnosis? Wayne syndrome, infantile esotropia, accommodative ET, infantile ET. Now, this is my daughter. Um, this is how she looked when, uh, and actually she presented at 18 months of age uh, with misalignment of her eyes. Notice that her Bruckner test, looking at the red reflex here, is asymmetric. It's brighter from the more misaligned eye. And she has estropia. She's now a nurse over at primary. You'll see her when we make rounds in the NICU. Um, and this is her, just so you don't think I'm a bad parent, when I put her in glasses. And she does have 2015 acuity in good stereo. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so I put her in glasses. What's her diagnosis? accommodative esotropia. This is a child, just to show you that people can have, as one of my mentors said, lice and fleas. Um, this patient has the appearance, and this patient had been told by a PD, one pediatrician, the one the parents stopped going to, that he just had a wide intercanthal distance and he was normal. And I'm here to tell you, when you look at this, look at where the light reflex is here. This eye is looking at you. And these light reflexes aren't quite where they should be because the camera flash is not coaxial with the camera's viewpoint. But this kid's got left esotropia in addition to the appearance. So he's got pseudoesotropia and true esotropia. And so, yes, uh, Asian kids with epicanthal folds can get infantile esotropia. And, I, I, you know, I, I, I've seen quite a few of them. And... Uh, uh, and so beware that circumstance um, and look carefully, form your own opinions. Now this patient, this is cool here. What we're seeing here is updrifting, a little bit in, interning, but updrifting mainly of that right eye. This is manifest. It's staying there when we took the cover away, DVD. And this child here, this is very cool. If you look here, you'll see under the cover, the left eye go up here, the right eye go up here. This is latent DVD. We only operate on DVD if it is noticeable, 
causing problems. It doesn't cause amblyopia, and operating on it, it, it doesn't make the kids see any better. So if they're getting picked on at school, you, you operate on it, and it typically shows up as kids get into school age. Now, this three-step test. This child walking down the cereal aisle at Smith's Food King, you look at this kid, come down the aisle like this, and you stop mom and you say, pardon me, your child has a, yeah, on which side? With that head tilt. Yes, absolutely. And why? Well, what happens is when he tips his head to the right, we remember our, we don't, we're not getting, it's, it's the encyclorotation of the eye that, that's driving the head tilt because what happens is when I come over here, there are two encyclorotators, superior oblique, superior rectus, right? Turns out that the superior rectus is not nearly as good because it has so much less angle than the, the um, superior oblique does on the globe. So when you tip your head here, the superior rectus tries to do the encyclorotation, but it really overshoots with the vertical at the same time. And so that updrifting that you see when you tip the head, the greater hyper on the, the ipsilateral head tilt is from the other muscle taking on the cyclorotary function. So that slam dunk, for those who haven't gone through, you know, the idea with this, if you remember right, left, right, left, right, left. So if you wind up with a right hypertrophia that is worse in left gaze, and on right head tilt, that's a right fourth nerve palsy. Uh, and the other way to think about this, at times, typically what you will see is three things. You're gonna see a head tilt, you're gonna see a face turn, and you're gonna see a chin down thing. So we're gonna be like this, okay? And the idea is that I'm going to tip my head to the right with that right fourth, I'm also going to turn my head a bit, my face a bit to the left, drop my chin down. Why? I want my right eye as far away from where that superior oblique is acting as possible. So you'll see those three things. Kind of again like pitch rolling yaw on that X, Y, and Z thing. If we talk about chin up, chin down, face turn right, face turn left, head tilt right, head tilt left, you can describe any head position. So. With superior oblique palsy, this kid is tipping his head because it allows him to maintain binocularity and equal vision. So that don't try to get the parents to hold the head straight. Have a good day, Tina. And uh, the um, the idea is that if you have them do that, they're going to be misaligned. They're going to lose vision. And so the idea is you want to take care of the problem because otherwise, with this kid, what's going to happen is by the time he is a teenager, he's going to have permanent changes in his facial bones. And he's going to wind up with changes that we can't make better in terms of the head tilt, maybe just, you know, permanent, even if we straighten the eyes out later. And so the other thing you see in this photo is that when we have this head tipped to the left, like he is here, the eyes are straight. And look at that right eye winging up towards the ceiling when he tips his head off to that right side. Isn't that cool? This is an adult with the same thing, and he is showing you a little bit. Now, he's got his head tipped to the right, and he's got his face turned to the right, and he's got a little bit of a chin down head position, all three of the things that I mentioned. And it's kind of fun to do this when people come into clinic, and you kind of look at them as they walk by, and you say, hmm, what's that patient have? And odds are you're right. The other issue you can look at is fun distortion. The fovea should be up here, and it is ex-cyclo-rotated. And in a patient who's nonverbal, you can do this. I've also used this in the operating room um, in, in an aphasic adult to look at the torsion and try to get things level because he was telling me things were like this, but he couldn't tell me with the uh, um, double, the bagley, the loose bagalini lenses that I used to measure torsion when he was level. It was a frustrating experience for him. This is that more magnification. Now, what's this kid got? He's looking straight ahead here. Yep, up and right, <clears throat> up and left, Brown syndrome. And that is um, due to either a congenital contracture, superior oblique tendon, 
or an acquired abnormality, usually inflammatory, around the trochlea, often seen with ethmoid sinusitis, sometimes seen with other systemic inflammatory condition, conditions that cause one uh, to see the uveitis service. Now this patient is trying to look up and right, straight up, and up and left. And this left eye doesn't go up well in any of those circumstances. What is the new term for this disorder? Heard of monocular elevation deficiency or double elevator palsy? That's what this is. And it's due to either a weakness in elevating the eye or restriction down below or both. Um, it isn't due to a primary neurologic insult uh, or something you can point a finger to and is often, if not always, present from birth. And we operate, if something's tight, we take care of that, usually the inferior rectus, and if not, doing a transposition, medial and lateral to the superior rectus, will take care of the uh, innervational issues. And I have seen things, just beware, if you see a patient that has had ptosis surgery, our ptosis, our, our oculoplastic surgery colleagues can cause something that looks just exactly like this, just by creating abnormal attachments between superior rectus and levator aponeurosis. So if it's, they've had ptosis surgery, go in and look there first uh, and free everything up and you'll probably fix the patient. What's this? Now this patient has is, is got a little bit of a left face turn and when he looks to his right a little bit, this is what you see. And when he looks to the left, this is what you see. Notice this, notice this, what's this? Dwayne's, which one? Type one, he's trying, he's got, and is it more common in this eye or this eye? Left eye and little girls. But it's like, you know, 49, 51, so it's not a huge difference, but that question does show up. And this is, we're trying to show here a secondary deviation in this patient who I believe actually has a sixth nerve palsy and not Dwayne's, but um, here he is fixing and when he fixes with this eye, here he's fixing with his sound right eye, small angle estropia, fixing with the left eye, large angle estropia. And there we've got primary and secondary deviation. And this is Dwayne's type three as we go through things here. And this eye isn't going in or out. Those eyes, you can do some surgery to make them straighter, but you cannot make them binocular. What's this guy got? Yeah. You say, sir, how long have you had thyroid troubles? When he walks in and sits in the chair, and they kind of look at you and say, how did you know? I say, it was kind of obvious. But, um, and this is more obvious, and this is another patient with Graves' disease. Now, this patient, on the other hand, there's a family picture of this child and about 10 relatives, <coughs> and they're all sitting like this, looking down their noses in the family picture. Kind of looks like the folks on the porch in Deliverance. But on the other hand, it is, and what do they have? Well, they probably have fibrosis syndrome and uh, a congenital fibrosis syndrome. And that occurs in a number of varieties. Elizabeth Engel um, is probably the world's foremost authority on it. And she's done a bunch of stuff with genetics of this and, and, and that worth if you're interested in this disorder. But I think that with this, you can't make a binocularity, you can make the eyes straight. All of these muscles are really tight. The surgery is incredibly difficult. And if you're contemplating operating that kid with this, call me so I can talk you out of it uh, because you will not have fun. Uh, but doing ptosis surgery to let them, you know, because they're back here like this, not because of the eye misalignment, it's a ptosis driving it because when they're here, their lids are down blocking everything. So get their lids fixed, get their eyes straightened out as much as you can and hope for the best and follow them closely. Now this patient comes in, and this patient at times has complete left ptosis, has complete right ptosis, sometimes a ZT, sometimes XT, and they've seen five different doctors, got five different answers, and you walk in and you say, I know what you've got, let's prove it. What do they have? Myasthenia, absolutely. And so does this patient. Now, this is myasthenia, and this is, I believe, with uh, Tensilon, and look at that. Now, Tensilon can do other weird things, so 
please don't use it randomly in clinic, particularly my clinic, without talking to me ahead of time. It wouldn't be a good thing. Um, I would probably send them down to the RTU or, or have neurology, you know, do it. You want it somewhere where they're monitored. Um, and this patient has always got this flat kind of affect and the eyes don't move from side to side. He's got some funny furrows in his tongue. What is the diagnosis? But it looks a little like fetal alcohol syndrome, doesn't it? But it's not. Medius. It's medius. Yeah, medius sequence. Yeah, and uh, uh, and these kids have a bilateral lateral gaze palsy. They can't move their eyes in either direction. It isn't a bilateral sixth nerve palsy, which has been reported to occur. I I take exception to that. It isn't that. But um, these kids, you can get their eyes straight. You cannot get them to move normally. And then this patient, this patient has, uh, uh, first of all, tell me what the diagnosis is. And then second is where is the lesion on the patient's MRI? And on which side? Yes. Yep. And then lastly, A and B patterns. So A and A patterns, you're either turned out more or you are uh, uh, have less ET you know, in, in, in um, down gaze, A pattern, V pattern, you have more ET or uh, uh, um, V pattern, you have less ET or more XT in up gaze. And so what we've got here with an A pattern is you're going to have greater ET or less XT in up gaze. So this disparity between up and down and, and question maybe, first of all, what kind of pattern is it? When we look at this patient, this patient is small angle ET and up gaze, large angle XT and down gaze. What kind of pattern is this? A. And this patient is essentially ortho and down gaze, large angle XT and up gaze. That's a V pattern, isn't it? And so when we look here, the thing that often goes with V patterns is, and this patient has XT and up gaze, their ET and down gaze, Notice this updrifting of the right eye. What is the major elevator of the eye in adduction? Inferior oblique. So this is right inferior oblique overaction, left inferior oblique overaction. And the answer when they ask you about this with a V pattern with inferior oblique overaction, and they'll ask you to choose between a number of, uh, of surgical options, is weaken the inferior obliques if they've got an inferior oblique overaction and then do horizontal surgery that makes sense for the primary position deviation. And if they don't have any, just do the inferior obliques. Now contrast, let's say this patient doesn't have any inferior oblique overaction, and we're gonna shift medial rectus muscles. Which way do we shift them with a V pattern? Down. Down, towards the apex. And you shift the laterals towards the open end of the V. Now, the same thing happens with an A pattern. You're always gonna shift with an A pattern. If you're operating on medial rectus muscles, whether you're doing a recession or resection, you shift it towards the apex lateral, uh, and, and laterals towards the open end. And you do that if you don't have oblique dysfunction. If you've got oblique dysfunction, do the, the obliques. Now, A patterns travel with superior oblique overaction. Let's see, I don't think I've got a picture of an A pattern there. Um, and this is quickly ROP. And uh, as long as you guys, I've got to wander over in about five minutes to primary to do a little bit of surgery. Um, but uh, what does this patient have? This, this is a neonate with blood vessels and this white thing behind the lens. Stage five. Yeah, stage five ROP. This is where the term retro lentil fibroplasia came from if you you know and, and realize when they first described this in the 1940s the only instrumentation scapins had not developed the injury they had a direct ophthalmoscope that's what they were examining these babies in the NICU with and so when you know think about that put yourself in their shoes take the direct ophthalmoscope the next time you go to do a consult in the NICU and see how much of the fundus you think you could see that's what their the initial epidemic of ROP so when we look at ROP, these are the zones. 
Zone one is a circle whose radius is twice the distance from optic nerve to fovea. Zone two, the radius becomes optic nerve to nasal or a serrata. And zone three is what is left outside of that. Staging. One is a line. Instead of just normal vascularization progressing, you have a line where normal vascularization stops and beyond is avascular retina, a raised ridge, stage two, extra retinal fibril proliferative tissue, three, and either extra fovea 4A or involves the fovea 4B. And like the MAC on MAC off thing we heard about at Grand Rounds, I think it was last week, uh, these do have implications. If your fovea is off, the outcome is never very good um, in terms of having sharp reading vision. Can a child still recover useful vision, be able to navigate in unfamiliar surroundings? You bet, it's always worth trying to save vision. And stage five, total detachment. And you know whether it's open funnel or closed funnel matters greatly if you are the pediatric picture retinal surgeon trying to put instruments in through pars plana or in that circumstance pars plicata and not uh, just destroy the retina with them. And so if it's closed funnel, unless you've got, there are some things, Mike Tracy has this magic substance that he developed in Detroit that they use to peel membranes and to try to separate things, uh, but the visual outcomes in those cases are not nearly as good as the dramatic anatomic successes that they've been able to achieve in some kids. So this is stage one ROP. You've got you can hallucinate a little line. Notice you don't see choroidal background as well, where you have avascular retina. And this is a little bit more stage one, maybe early stage two here. <laughs> this is definitely a raised three-dimensional structure. This is stage two. Notice the striking difference with the avascular retina. This is stage three. Yep. And the, this is just attached stage three as well here again, where there was stage three, things have grown out farther. When you see these big vessels as you head to the periphery, you'll always see something out here, like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This shows a 4A detachment, 4B, the fovea is now detached. This is a total exudative detachment um, in a kid with very, very posterior, zone one, ROP. An official photo taken here, unfortunately, at the University of Utah. Um, Paula Morris, who retired here a while ago. Anybody here? Remember, you guys know Paula? Yeah, Paula, what we did is brought kids from the NICU over to Moran, or it was then Clinic 8 in University Hospital, and put them on a mail stand on their side with a lid speculum in and took pictures with the Zeiss, big Zeiss camera. There was no <coughs> ret cam and the Kawa camera, I could get pictures the size of an indirect holding it by hand using the indirect lens, but they weren't the quality they wanted for the study. So Paula graciously took those photos and deserves credit for that. This is plus disease. This is the standard photo in the original ICROP uh, um, description, this is republished in 1988. The first publication of that, I think, was in 85. Um, and um, in a later clarified, now meaning that you have two quadrants thinking of, and this is a left eye, supranasal, infranasal, supratemporal, infratemporal, either venous engorgement arterial or tortuosity in the posterior pole, by definition, two quadrants or more <coughs> for plus disease. <coughs> this is more fulminant plus disease, four quadrants involved. I think everybody would call this plus disease. This is dilated to iris vessels. They're of no significance with ROP other than when you get them, often the pupil doesn't dilate well, making it really difficult. And this is very posterior flat aggressive posterior ROP change in zone one. Classic treatment 
was either eight non-contiguous or five contiguous clock hours of stage three with plus disease in cryo -rump. Now, type one, and you do need to know this, this may well show up, is if you've got any ROP with plus disease in zone one, no matter what it is, that's type one, meaning I need treatment. If in zone one, you've got stage three with or without plus disease, they get treated. And out in zone two, stage two or three with plus disease. And this is dramatically different. Remember that the eight non-contiguous and five contiguous clock hours, we used to sit and wait and you say, well, I think it's four and a half. It's not really five. We're not gonna treat them now. If you've got one clock hour, you get treated. And that is a big difference. And, and I was involved heavily in this study and in writing, help write the paper that laid all this stuff out so that this stuff is near and dear to me. Um, if you have questions about it, talk to me. But the, you know, the idea with this and the reason we came up with this type one, type two thing was that the study that led to this, um, e, e, um, the ETROP study, early treatment of ROP study, um, we used a computer modeling program that said you were either at high risk or low risk. If you're at high risk, you got treated. If you're low risk, we watched you. And the bottom line is that we had a choice of either saying anybody who did ROP had to have this computer nomogram at their fingertips and be calculating and putting all this data in, or could we fit something else to the data? And the type one, type two schema came from this. And, and type two is I've got ROP, but it isn't type one. That's type two ROP. And so there you are, and my apologies if it isn't there, but if we've got, again, in zone one, stage one or stage two ROP without plus disease, watch these kids like a hawk. They probably need to be seen more than weekly. Out in zone two, if you've got some stage three without plus disease, use your judgment. Typically, we'll just follow them once a week. And so if you are type one, or if you've reached convent, you know, conventional threshold, something got missed, they were really sick and couldn't be examined, we treat them and we follow the type twos very closely. I'm gonna stop there, I've gotta get over to primary. What questions do you guys have? Otherwise, good luck with OCAPS, I'm glad it's you and not me. And, uh, and there you are.